for America, there's about 6.9 million people that have a paralysis from from various you know, conditions and, and and diseases. And you know, if we can help even a small fraction of those, then then everything we do here is worthwhile. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your daily helping. Dr. Nicholas Opie is a biomedical engineer with experience in neural prosthesis and the co-head of the Vascular Bionics Laboratory. Dr. Opie was awarded his PhD in 2012 for research developing a bionic eye. He was employed as a surgical program coordinator on Bionic Vision, Australia's retinal prosthesis project, and was integral in the development and preclinical validation of the technology designed to restore rudimentary vision to the profoundly blind. This device was implanted in patients in 2014 with great success. In 2012, Dr. Opie was awarded a $1.33 million grant from the U.S. defense organization DARPA to develop a minimally invasive brain-machine interface. This funding and subsequent funding totaling more than $5.5 million has enabled Dr. Opie to establish and co-lead the Vascular Bionics Laboratory within the Department of Medicine at the University of Melbourne, a laboratory which has grown to support more than 20 graduate and undergraduate researchers. Dr. Opie is leading the research team conducting preclinical safety and efficacy trials on a device capable of recording neural information from within a blood vessel, which may enable direct brain control of wheelchairs, exoskeletons, and computers to people with paralysis as early as 2017. Dr. Opie is the founding CTO of SmartStet, a company incorporated to translate endovascular bionic technology into clinical application. From down in Australia, please welcome Dr. Nicholas Opie. Hey, so me on, Dr. Richard. Absolutely. I wanted to tell people a little bit more about what you've been doing because it's absolutely remarkable. So let's start in the beginning. You helped develop a bionic eye, and this was back in 2012. So tell me how you got started in that and what came from that. Uh, yeah, so I've always had a had a big interest in how to combine uh, physiology and and engineering uh, ever since my very very young days, and I was fortunate enough to be born in a time where it's possible to now integrate man and machine. One of the first applications of this through through my PhD and work after that was, as like you've mentioned, a, a bionic eye or a device that was designed to restore fundamental uh, vision for people who are profoundly blind. And by doing so, we were able to develop an electrode array or a series of, of stimulating panels that could electrically excite the the neurons in the in the eye or the, the retinal ganglion cells. And by doing so, we could restore or re- return some of the, the vision that had been lost by disease and degeneration. That's absolutely amazing. So this was back in 2012 when you were doing this work on the eye. That's right? That's correct, yes. So once you developed the eye, how has the development gone with that in terms of trialing that on humans and, and what's happened since then? Uh, so that work's been going going very well. We implanted it in, in a small patient trial, uh, a human clinical trial in, in 2014, and that they had some some amazing results, and and since then the the work has been progressing and uh, towards the conduction of another clinical trial with you know, obviously advanced technology. So so that work is is doing very well, and I know there are other groups around the world as well as those working here in Melbourne who are doing some, some more fantastic research to try and uh, restore vision. 
And in terms of what somebody sees, you know, this sounds so much like science fiction to me. It's absolutely unbelievable. So if an individual lost their vision and then they had these eyes implanted, do they have full sight like you and I do? What does it, what does it look like for the person who gets this? So it's, it's not full sight yet. So I, there's, there's a long way to, to go. I like to think of it as a, as a computer screen with, with a certain number of pixels. And depending on how many electrodes you, you implant into the eye, so the, the patient's eye remains and we slip a, an electrode array into the back of it. Depending on how many electrodes these arrays have, you can have a different number of pixels. So, uh, for example, with 100 pixels, you could probably uh, form different words that, that the patient could, could see and, and perceive. And, and obviously with you know, thousands, you could start seeing faces and maybe tens of thousands even more and so forth. Uh, to put it in comparison, our eyes have, have around about 1.2 million. So we've got a long way to go to get the, the number up there to see exactly the same as sighted people would see. However, even very very fundamental vision can you know shown to help these people a lot. They can avoid um, obstacles in, on the road and they can see when a, a door is open and closed. And, and very basic things like that are, are also extremely helpful. So this was foundational in terms of moving eventually towards people being able to have full vision. It's almost like, I guess the analogy would be you're working on you know, a standard definition apparatus when the rest of the world is in 4K. So there's room to go, but you're on the way. That's right. That's right. You've got to, you've got to start off uh, at the basics and make sure you get those right and then, then build up on them accordingly. And I think uh, especially the guys in Australia have done that very well. That's really fantastic. So now, this happened in 2012. Was that the foundation for your being able to create the Vascular Bionics Laboratory? Yeah, it's certainly uh, I mean, excellent exposure to, to the world of medical bionics and learning how to take devices, uh, you know, essentially that were just sketches and, and through development and, and preclinical trials to get them implanted in patients. Through the work that we, we did there, um, colleague Tom Oxley and I were able to write a, uh, a grant to the American um, Department of DARPA and were successful in, in getting some seed funding to, to develop this new endovascular technology. Now, I suspect many people have never heard the term vascular bionics. Could you talk a little bit about what that means? And then we'll talk more about what you've done with that seed money and what you're working on now, which is really incredible. Sure. So vascular bionics in, in my mind is a way to combine uh, biology and, and electronics, which is bionics. And vascular bionics is a way of doing that in the bloodstream. There are a number of devices that use blood vessels uh, very well, uh, obviously pacemakers, which a lot of people know about, and and stents to, to stop vascular occlusion or to, or to remove clots. And so a lot of these devices are, are becoming very useful and, and widely used in the clinic. Uh, and we saw that as a, a very good way to access the brain without open brain surgery. So a lot of technologies, especially those making brain-machine interfaces, which are devices designed to record neural activity or brain signals, and convert these into commands or controls that a patient with paralysis, for example, can use to to have function of an exoskeleton or a wheelchair. These devices require uh, electrodes or or technology to be very close to the brain. Uh, historically, this has been done by by a risky procedure, open brain surgery, which has a, a high complication rate. And once this surgery has been performed, and the this part of the skull has been removed, the electrodes are implanted into the brain directly to get these signals out that uh, people with paralysis can't can't get out themselves due to, to spinal cord injury or otherwise. And these technologies, they're working, they're working very well, but there is a concern of safety and there is a concern that these devices, because of their invasive nature, are uh, not working for as long as they as long as they could. And so we came up with a a vascular bionics alternative to 
to this technology and by using blood vessels as a pathway to access the brain without having to perform this invasive surgery. So talk to us a little bit about how that works, that you're, you're using blood vessels to get into the brain to deliver a solution, whereas prior to that, for decades, we've been relying on, as you said, a dangerous, potentially dangerous surgical procedure, which may or may not have a variety of complications. So what do you specifically do with the blood vessels and then how do they get into the brain? Yeah, good question. So the reason we need to get into the brain and not put electrodes on the surface, as some other groups are are trying, is for people who need to control highly dexterous assistive technologies such as prosthetic limbs or wheelchairs or computers, the skull attenuates the signals that are required to control these devices. So unfortunately, putting electrodes on the surface of the brain, which is which is very safe, uh, doesn't have the results yet that to show that, that that's the way to go. So some sort of surgery is, is required. And obviously, as you mentioned, the open brain surgery is, is a risky procedure. Um, but it has shown that people uh, who have paralysis, whether that's because of stroke or spinal cord injury or, or traumatic loss of limb, they have brains that are still functioning as if they were before their injury, which means that the, when they're thinking about moving their legs or their arms, they can still generate the same thoughts or the same brain signals and we just need to try and get in there and, and extract these and then bypass their, their damaged um, nervous system to, to control electric devices. So we're using the, the blood vessels because there's many blood vessels in the, in the brain already. There's a large precedence for implanting devices through vessels, as I mentioned, with pacemakers and, and different stents. And so we have the opportunity to use this as a method to access the the brain um, with with very minor surgery. So then once you've done this, essentially you're capturing the brain signals and converting them into something that can talk to the technology. You mentioned a number of different applications. You mentioned traumatic brain injury, of course, stroke. would this be useful potentially for somebody, for example, with Parkinson's disease or somebody with epilepsy? We'll have to say that I'm a, an engineer, so I, I can't give any medical advice. But uh, speaking with my colleagues, certainly there is a large application for uh, for this technology to be used for not only recording, as you would for people with paralysis when you want to control external equipment, but also for, for stimulation and Accessing the brain in a way that doesn't have this surgery means that not only the hospital uh, stay or or durations that people have to stay are shorter, but obviously the the long-term benefits and and safety is is a lot better. And it has been suggested that if we can get into different parts of the brain, which we can with, with the large number of blood vessels that are there, we would be able to record neural activity and see when someone's having a seizure, for example, and then potentially provide stimulation to, to suppress that seizure. Uh, alternatively, like, like you mentioned with, with Parkinson's tremor, at the moment they do use electrical stimulation to, um, to, to suppress the, the tremor. And, and again, this is one application that this technology would have by stimulating the, the correct regions to stop this from happening. That's right. So for now, what they do is essentially insert a coil into somebody's head that generates an electric charge. And this would be very different and far less invasive, potentially. Really fascinating. That's the aim. Yeah, that's that's certainly the aim. We want to try and get there with uh, not only the the least amount of uh, surgical risk, but also with the the greatest chance of success. And and unfortunately, some of these other devices, because they are invasive and because they are implanted into the brain directly, which causes a little bit of damage, they stop working over over a period of time. And in some of the, the work we've found, because our device is in a blood vessel, it's almost it's almost invisible to the brain. So the reactions that occur don't that, that stop these other devices working don't occur to our device. Which is which is really fascinating. 
One of the one of the things you mentioned, which I'd like you to clarify if you could, you've talked a couple times about you know, basically recording this neural information and hooking the brain up to computers. And I I'm following you in terms of you're talking about the brain controlling wheelchairs and exoskeletons, which I do want to get into that a little bit more in a, in a couple moments. But tell me about some of the other things that your lab's working on in terms of hooking the brain up to computers and what you guys are doing in terms of that. Well, yeah, great question. What we're trying to do really is to develop a, a neural translator where we can get the brain's signals and understand these and then use them to control anything really. I mean, if the patient needs lower limb prosthetics or exoskeletons, we'd like to be able to control that. If the patient needs upper limb or or robotic hands, then we'd like to be able to control them. And similarly, if they need electric wheelchairs or, or computers, we, we want to give them the opportunity to control all of those devices as well. So we're not focused so much on one particular, uh, what's called assistive technology, but we want to develop a a way of extracting and interpreting the the language of the brain so that any piece of equipment that that someone makes can be or someone needs can be used by by our device. What are the biggest challenges that you've run into thus far in your work? I suppose we've we've had a lot of challenges all the time, which is what makes this work so exciting. Uh, we love finding the problems and and trying to solve them, and I suppose one of the the reasons we got into this to start with was because there was this problem of this amazing technology. There are some robotic limbs and, and exoskeletons that have been made by, by various companies around the globe that are fantastic, but they just have never been able to connect them up to people to get them to work to their full potential. So the challenge that we faced was to try and not only get these devices working, uh, the, the arms and the legs and so forth, but to do it in a way that was safer and better than any technology that exists and, I suppose the biggest challenge we had was trying to implant devices through blood vessels, which are which are relatively small, and yet make sure that they contain all the right sensors and electrodes to get the signals we need, as well as making sure that there's not a risk of of the vessel being um, being occluded or damaged, and we're we're able to take a lot of uh, advice and a lot of knowledge from the, the stent field that have been metallic self-expanding scaffolds inside vessels for a while to keep vessels open and we're able to build our electronic system on that to make sure that the the internal part of the vessel doesn't become occluded with our technology. So there are a lot of challenges. Uh, there's some every day, but I wouldn't have it any other way. We love it. <laughs> and it, it, as a point of clarification, obviously – in that you're working with blood vessels, the devices you're working with are extraordinarily tiny. Is this the same thing as nanotechnology? That's a term that has been in the media quite a bit recently. Well, it's interesting you mention that. So as I mentioned before with the, the bionic eye, you need to have a large number of, of electrodes, if you will, to give very precise uh, signals. So uh, you can get a lot of high resolution we're not interested so much in a lot of signals. Um, we just want really high quality ones. And the signals we're recording are, are local field potentials, which are essentially large signals from thousands of, of neurons at once. Most of the technology, the, the arms, the legs, the exoskeletons, computers, don't need you know, hundreds or thousands of different commands. They only need a few commands that they need to be really reliable. So, so nanotechnology um, is certainly being used in, in medical bionics. It's certainly got a place for what we're doing, but at the moment we're, we're really focused on high-quality uh, signals but a relatively low number compared to what nanotech can, can offer. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for clarifying that. And I know that you're also involved in a company called Smart Stent. You're actually the founding CTO. Uh, tell us a little bit about Smart Stent and what you're doing there. Sure. So Smart Stent is an Australian company. It's, it's now owned by, uh, flipped into the US in a company called Synchron. And this is a company really that was designed from, 
from day one to ensure that our research can be translated to, to clinical application. Uh, as a, an engineer working on my PhD, as I'm sure other engineers and researchers have, have become to realise, if you make something that's that's really good and fantastic, it's often very difficult to put that into clinical use. And one of the things we wanted to make sure from the start, this is, this is Tom, the CEO, and, and I, as well as other director role, we wanted to be very clear that what we were going to do was going to be useful for, for humans and wouldn't just sit on the shelf uh, gathering dust. And, and so we started this company to make sure that we had all the all the dominoes lined up so that we could get this into into the clinic as soon as possible. And in terms of that, you mentioned, you know, going back to the eye that you, you know, had a clinical trial in 2014 for some of these other applications you're working on, the brain controlled wheelchairs and the exoskeletons. Where are we with that in terms of a, a time frame and clinical trials and such? Yeah, great question. So we're we're doing a lot of the preclinical work now to to validate the chronic safety and efficacy of our device. We've already done a lot of proof of concept work, so we know that what we're implanting is going to be safe, and we know that it does work. Uh, we just need to repeat a number of these tests in in accordance with ethical and, and regulatory guidelines to to validate its its use for an implantation in, in a human patient population and. We're hoping that we'll be able to have our first um, what's called a, a small patient pilot trial in the next couple of years and following which obviously a large pivotal trial which will be conducted ideally um, all around the globe. So this is not science fiction pie in the sky. This is you're saying in the next couple of years you're going to be conducting, if all goes well, a clinical trial in which somebody who is paralyzed via your technology may have the capacity to walk again via an exoskeleton or control a wheelchair by their brain. Yep, absolutely. Uh, It's definitely going to happen. And the question I have isn't, will it work? But it's how well is it going to work and how long is it going to work for? So we're very confident that it's, we're going to be able to get people to control wheelchairs and, and computers. Can we give them enough control to be able to, to control a prosthetic limb or a, an arm which has 22 switches, we don't know, but we're certainly aiming quite high, and and we're we're very pleased that uh, of the progress we've made, and very excited about the, the human trials that are uh, really just around the corner. I imagine you probably have quite a lot of people who have you know, injuries and illnesses and such who are wanting to partake in these clinical trials. Yeah, I, I know that there's. Um, some stats in for America, there's about 6.9 million people that have a paralysis from from various you know, conditions and and, and diseases. And you know, if we can help even a small fraction of those, then then everything we do here is worthwhile. And relative to some of the other solutions that are out there, what does your solution cost relative to the others? And and I don't mean in terms of dollars and cents. I mean you know. Relatively speaking, is it more expensive? Is this something that you know the the average person is going to be able to get involved in? Look at uh, again, great question. I suppose that remains to be seen, but I certainly uh, am not designing this technology for people not to be able to afford it. I, you know, if it was possible to give it away free to everybody, then we'd certainly look into doing that. But I think that's that's not going to be realistic, but but obviously we don't want to have the price as something that prevents people from accessing this. I mean, we're doing this because we we want to help people. Oh, of course, that's that's really what it's all about. I, I am curious about something because you've been talking a lot about essentially creating this roadmap, this Rosetta Stone, if you will, upon which you're able to translate somebody's brainwaves and link them into a computer. And one of the things that so many people are concerned about in this day and age is cybersecurity and their data, their information, their biometric information being hacked. Is there a danger, is there a possibility that if somebody is utilizing your technology and you have this computer system in place that's translating our actual brainwaves that somebody could do 
somebody could hack that? Hmm. Well, I, I like the analogy with the Rosetta Stone. I, I think that's uh, that's quite a clever one. Um, so for what we're doing with paralysis, all the information is coming from the person out. So there's nothing going going back in. So there's no way that that could be controlled by by someone with with nefarious purposes in mind. And I think you've seen from from this technology, it's been around for a number of years, and there's never really been a reason why someone would want to do that to anyone else. Uh, this question does come up a lot. I, I know that there is some concern that people will start, as, as you put it, hacking into other people's brains, but no, I don't think that's that's going to happen at all. The, the brain's far too complex to to force it to do things. Certainly getting information out of the brain and trying to work out what it means is, is possible, but, but going the other way around is is a whole different um, kettle of fish. So, well, that's that's good to know that nobody's going to be able to flip a switch and then <laughs> take control of, of your exoskeletons. Uh, and, I, and I'm joking a little bit, but, you know, it, it's certainly something, it, it's, it's a hot item right now that people are talking about. And, and you said that you've been asked it quite a lot. So I, I'm glad you're able to address that. No worries. I hope that's uh, made everyone feel a little bit safer that that you are protected within your own head. (laughs) I I think so, for sure. Well, what else would you like to tell us about where you see this technology going in the next five to 10 years? Well, for our five to 10 year plan, obviously aiming for for closer towards the five or less is to, to get it out to market so that anyone who who wants or, or needs one has has the access to this technology that can you know, restore some some level of mobility and independence as we discussed earlier by putting enhancing the technology for stimulation there's other conditions such as you know parkinson's and and epilepsy and potentially even post traumatic stress that can be treated with with this technology but but to be honest uh I'm excited to see where it's going to go. There's a lot of work that's being conducted all around the globe on how to interface with with the brain and how to get the brain to control external equipment. And fascinated to see where it's going to end up. It's very exciting times. And I know we're getting a little away from from your core tech, but you brought it up, so I, I'd like to ask: Could you tell us how you see your technology helping somebody with PTSD? To be honest, I'm I'm not the best uh, person to ask about that, but I have been uh, has been suggested by some of the clinicians I work with that electrical stimulation has a way of resetting the brain. I, I suppose um, I, I think you need to get some some better information on that, but but this is just something that that's come up in in you know quite a few conversations with people suggesting uh, various other alternative applications for our tech. Uh, so I don't I'm not suggesting that this is going to be the way forward, but it's certainly something that we'll look into. It does make sense. I know that technologies like neurofeedback have been used for quite a long time with soldiers who have come back uh, from combat with PTSD. So I I was really curious when when you had mentioned that, but it it certainly is interesting to be sure. Yeah, and it might might be a way that we can access very small regions of the brain uh, and provide very small and localized focused stimulation that might be a benefit we don't know and it's certainly an interesting question that we'll we'll be looking at in the future so you've got smart stent you've got the vascular bionics lab where you're working on all of these amazing things you're still doing the bionic eye how do you balance all that oh, i love it i guess i'm quite a good juggler Maybe I should have joined the circus, uh, but I do enjoy um, having a lot of different things on my plate and I love the field that I'm in and I'm very excited every day to come to work and, and try and solve new problems. They say that if you love what you do, then it's not actually work at all. That's, that's true. That's very true. Well, Nick, this has been absolutely incredible. And what I'd like to do is wrap up with a question that I ask everybody, and that is, what is the biggest helping, you know, the one single most important piece of information for somebody to walk away with who's listened to you talk today? I think the the biggest part is what you mentioned last, but if you enjoy what you do, then it's not working. That's what I like to live by. I 
everything I do is because it's something I enjoy and I, something I want to do. And I think that if everyone can can take that bit of advice and and do what they are passionate about, then you know, their lives will be a lot happier and they'll they'll have a great time doing it. So thank you, uh, Dr. Richard, for having me on. Um, great questions, and hopefully uh, you and your audience got something out of it. Well, I, I certainly did, and and I can tell you that as a clinician, having worked with many patients who have experienced some of these illnesses and injuries that you speak of, traumatic brain injuries, stroke, seizure, whereas they really have believed that you know their injury, the disease that they contracted, that was it for them. Here you are developing something exactly that's going to give hope, which is absolutely incredible and I'm very grateful for the work that you're doing. And Nick, where can people find you online and find out more about what you're doing? I, th- I think if you, if you Google my name, uh, Nicholas Opie, I'm sure uh, some bits and pieces come up and you might be able to contact me that way. Uh, but again, to, to anyone out there who, who does have a have an injury and they think that there's there's no hope, that's, uh, that's certainly not the case. Uh, we're only one uh, small group around the world who's doing doing this sort of stuff. There are many of them and breakthroughs are happening all the time. So you just got to stay positive and, and something will come your way. Amazing. Again, thank you so much. And that's it for today. Thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, go subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave a five-star review. This is what helps others find our podcast. And most importantly, go out there and do something nice for somebody else. Even if you've never met them, even if you don't know them, post it in your feeds using hashtag MyDailyHelping because the happiest people are those that help others. 